Welcome and thank you for standing by. All participants are in a listen-only mode until the question answer session of today's call. At that time, you can press star 1 to ask a question, unmute and record your name. Again, that will be star 1. Today's call is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. It's my pleasure to turn the call over to Phil Thompson. You may now begin, sir. Okay, well, thanks, Michelle. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. As Michelle mentioned, I am Phil Thompson, and I want to welcome you to today's Modernizing Construction Indicators webinar. The way we've measured construction activity has not really changed since the 1950s until now. This webinar will review the U.S. Census Bureau's vision for the future of construction, including how we are leveraging artificial intelligence and machine learning, satellite imagery, and detailed third-party data sources to deliver more accurate, more timely, and more granular construction data products. As Michelle mentioned, this uh, webinar is being recorded. Uh, the webinar recording and transcript will be available between five to 10 business days after this presentation. If we are experience any technical delays, please utilize the chat feature to notify us of issues should any, of our, should any arise and we'll do our best to address them. And lastly, at the end of the presentation, we'll open the lines for a question and answer session. To allow everyone an opportunity to ask a question, we ask it that you ask one question and one follow-up question. I would like to introduce our speakers for today. Aiden Smith is the Assistant Division Chief over the uh, Construction Indicator Programs here at the Census Bureau. Hector Ferranato is the Director of Technology of Reveal Global Consulting. So Hector and Aiden, I now turn it over to you. All right, thanks, Phil. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you all for joining us. We're excited for the opportunity to, to provide an overview of our ongoing efforts to modernize the U.S. Census Bureau's construction indicators. As Phil mentioned, I'm Aiden Smith, Assistant Division Chief over the Construction Indicator Programs at the Census Bureau. And I'm joined today by Hector Farinata, Director of Technology at Reveal Global Consulting. I want to start with just a brief overview of our current construction indicators. There are three Census Bureau principal federal economic indicators that measure construction. New residential construction, commonly referred to as housing starts, includes several key measures of residential construction activity, including building permits, housing starts, and housing completions. New residential sales, commonly referred to as new home sales, provides measures related specifically to sales of single-family homes, including numbers sold, median and average sales prices, and for-sale inventory. Construction spending, commonly referred to as value of construction put in place, or VIP, provides measures of total spending on private and public, residential and non-residential construction. To produce these indicators, we currently use several monthly surveys that are heavily reliant on field interviews and or paper collection. While our data users continually require more timely and more granular data products, the traditional survey approach and associated collection cost and respondent burden limits our ability to meet that need. Through our construction reengineering initiative, we are rethinking and modernizing our approach to construction measurement to overcome these limitations. For today's discussion, we'll focus on three of the major efforts currently underway. <clears throat> These include a redesign of the sample and integration of alternative data sources for the Building Permit Survey, or BPS. And we'll also talk about the potential to apply machine learning and satellite imagery to support the Survey of Construction, or SOC. Before we jump into the planned improvements for BPS, let's talk briefly about its current state and the associated limitations we seek to address. The BPS forms the foundation of our construction indicator programs, measuring the first stage of, of the construction life cycle, permit authorization. On a monthly basis, we survey a probability sample out of the roughly 20,000 permit issuing jurisdictions in the United States, and any places not selected for this monthly sample are surveyed annually. Our current approach to the BPS has a few limitations, one of which is simply that it relies on voluntary participation. And on a monthly basis, the current design only supports representative estimates down to the state level, with sub-state estimates only reflecting a simple tally of the jurisdiction selected for that monthly sample. So 
how are we tackling these limitations? As a first step, we are transitioning the BPS from a representative sample to a cutoff sample, with the first estimates from this new design slated for release early next year. In this approach, we focus collection efforts on jurisdictions with the most permit activity, specifically those that authorize six or more housing units per year on average. The remaining 11,300 jurisdictions, roughly, which account for less than 1% of all units authorized each year, would be imputed or modeled for each month, with most, if not all, reflecting zero or one unit per month. This approach will allow us to produce complete local estimates on a monthly basis and unlock the ability to publish new, more granular data products and visualizations going forward. A slightly less obvious advantage to the new design is that it also positions us to more easily integrate alternative data sources in lieu of traditional survey reporting, which we'll talk about next. As I've mentioned, the BPS surveys local governments, monthly or annually, to ask the total number of new residential units authorized by permits. While it would be too burdensome to ask these governments to report the detailed information for every individual permit, there are several private entities that also collect and aggregate building permits, including this more detailed information. We are researching the feasibility of leveraging data from these types of vendors to not only reduce our need for survey data collection, but also to obtain more detailed permit information at the same time. Our current research revolves around establishing automated workflows that can reliably classify and geolocate the third-party permits based on their detailed information and matching this curated data to the jurisdictions that we currently survey to assess completeness and accuracy. The vendor data currently under review covers about 2,000 of the 20,000 permit issuing jurisdictions in the United States, but this is skewed towards jurisdictions with the highest permit activity. Based on our initial research using data from October and November of 2019, we estimate that the jurisdictions covered by the third-party data sources account for about 70% of all single-family units authorized in the United States as of 2019. Beyond data provided by vendors, we are also able to obtain information for some jurisdictions from local websites where individual permits are posted because they are public information. Where standardized site forms or APIs exist, we can leverage web scraping and other automated methods to capture permit data in lieu of traditional survey response. We are further refining the processing of these sources to classify the permits correctly. This includes use of shapefiles to match the latitude and longitude uh, information from the permits to the appropriate jurisdiction, as well as the development of classification algorithms that will correctly identify and extract only those permits that are in scope to our intended measures, that is, issued permits for new residential construction. We are also assessing the timeliness of the monthly vendor and website data, as this is critical to meeting our established monthly release schedules. As we continue our research and analysis on the comparability and usability of these alternative data sources, we have a few key steps ahead of us. These include incorporating expanded vendor coverage, refining our permit mapping and classification algorithms through data science techniques such as natural language processing, and of course, establishing back-end architecture to appropriately integrate these data flows into our existing indicator processing. All of these efforts are bringing us closer to our goal of reducing our reliance on traditional survey collection modes, but perhaps the most exciting research is what we'll dive into next. As we move forward with the upcoming BPS redesign and continue to prove in alternative data sources for permits, we are also charging forward with research and development of new methods to detect and track construction activity by leveraging satellite imagery and machine learning. Let me briefly set the stage before we dive into the really cool stuff. As I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, our construction indicators currently rely on several surveys working in combination. While the Building Permit Survey provides measures of the first step in the construction project, the permit authorization, the Survey of Construction, or SOC, follows up on a subset of these permits to collect information related to the construction start date, completion date, sales price, and other characteristics such as square footage. And as you may have guessed, there are a number of limitations 
that cascade directly from the current way we conduct the survey. The SOC relies heavily on field interviews and road canvassing, and this means the current data collection operation is expensive. This cost effectively limits our sample size, resulting in a design that only supports estimates down to the census region level, has high sampling errors, and can produce month-to-month -month estimates that can be volatile with substantial revisions. Our research into alternative data sources and methodologies, such as satellite imagery and machine learning models, is directly driven by our need to address these limitations. And with that bit of background out of the way, I will turn it over to Hector to share our progress to date in this effort. Thank you, Aiden. Yes, this is Hector Fernando, uh, Director of Technology for Review Global Consulting, working in collaboration with Census um, Construction Engineering effort. And I'll show you guys today our current progress for how we're reapplying uh, the latest machine learning um, algorithms and models to actually create a prototype and now uh, validating that prototype um, that would help us actually create or estimate the construction data that we're looking for using satellite imagery. So the goal, as we mentioned, is to uh, use that, the technique, the combination of satellite images and machine learning models to find construction starts and track them throughout the construction stages. Of course, we want to do that while keeping the cost and time of processing down. As I walk you uh, through the progress, you see, you're going to see we had a lot of stages before we got you know, to where we are now. Initially, we've done a lot of research. Uh, actually, we had a collaboration with Stats Canada, where they, they were working on a similar project using machine learning and satellite imagery to infer um, different construction indicators than Census uh, is doing, but we actually talked a lot and learned from them some, some of the best techniques we could use. And before what you see here, which is our initial model, we had our research model that uh, we've learned a lot of these new machine learning algorithms, uh, specifically convolutional neural networks, which are models that are used very well for image problems or vision problems, as we call them. And if we wanted to find construction in images, in satellite images, automatically, we learned that CNN, which I just described as convolutional neural networks, uh, were the best models to start with. So we prototype a model using open source images and had really good results, you know, a 90% accuracy, uh, which led us to actually gather our own data and collect our own images and start uh, building up this uh, model. So what you see here right now is what we call the POC model, IC1, the first version. What we've done was in order to collect our own data to train our model, the data is, are the images, right? So in order to do that, we first took uh, permit data and we created an automated way to label, to collect and label images based off permit information. So what we have done was, if you think about each permit, the information contained on a permit, uh, at least for the model, there are two pieces of information that are, that is, that are very important. The first one is the location, latitude and longitude, as you see there in the middle, and the permit date, right? The authorization date of that permit. So what we've developed was we took each permit and we estimated three different dates or three different images that we were trying to capture for that permit or for each permit. So every permit, you did three different images, right? And the dates were based off uh, this estimated construction stage. So what you see there on the bottom of the slide are three different categories that we started this problem with. The first category or class is called pre-construction. Then you have your construction start in the middle and uh, in the very end of the project, you'd have your construction completion. So again, for each permit, we estimated what was the date that that permit or that location for that permit was uh, going through the pre-construction stage or the start or the completion. And based on the estimated date, 
we captured satellite images, as you see there in the slide, for those stages, right? And again, this is an estimation, so it doesn't guarantee that the image that we're collecting would fall into that category, right? If a project was too early or a little bit late, um, what would happen is you would have your maybe your image for your start, you know, a little earlier would, would show up in the pre-construction stage. So we had to do some, some filtering, but in the end of it, we end up with 3,000 images labeled into pre-constructions or starts or completions. And that was our image set, our training set. So we took all those images We've trained a CNN model, and we got very good results. So what you see on the top right of this slide is some of the metrics. Um, for this whole presentation, you see two specific metrics. We either talk about accuracy or we will talk about F1 score, which also considers precision and recalls. So based on just this prototype, we were able to achieve about 90%, again, uh, uh, accuracy and F1 scores within the validation set, right? So this is within, when you train it, before you train, you actually separate 80% of the images for training, 20% for testing, which you don't train on. So that's how we are achieving these metrics you see here. Obviously this needs uh, further validation and that's where we're gonna dive into. So, you know, if, if you just think about the technical, we might lose track of how we're actually gonna apply this thing, you know, month to month to month. So what we end up, Architecting, architecting the whole uh, solution with was two modes. First, you have your hunting mode. Essentially, uh, we can choose locations, and every month we go in and we sample. We take an image, take images from the locations we selected, and we process those images through the model. What we get are outputs or classifications for each location, and what is the model telling us uh, about the status of construction for that specific location. So hunting mode is essentially we're trying to find where are the starts happening. So if we task Howard County, we process those images through the model, are we finding any starts, right? So we're hunting for starts. So that's our initial phase. Once we find a start, what we do is we pin that location and we keep tracking it month by month. We keep getting new images, and every image we get every month, we'll process that and see how is the classification changing for that specific location. So in a way, you find your construction starts uh, through the hunting mode, and once you find them, we track that specific construction project all the way to the end. And what is the end? Well, the end is when the model switches from classifying that image, that location, from a start all the way to a completion, right? Our completion here, we're setting it to be when you see the roof in place, uh, completed roof in place, that for us is a completion, right? So the definitions here, again, sometimes um, you, you, essentially for the model, you have to define what your start is and what your completion is. And that's how we, Essentially, it's, it, 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 it reflects on how we train the model, right? So for our use case here, the start is when you see the excavation or foundation on the image, and the completion is when you see or the model sees the actual roof in place. So hunting mode and tracking mode is how we're going to apply this technical um, solution into a business value that can happen every month. So we've talked about how we're going to find the starts, how we're going to track them, how about validating? That's also very important, right? Since, you know, this is a new thing, there's nothing to compare it against. So how do we validate the classification from the model, right? How do we know the model is actually finding the starts or completions? Well, one way is we create a, a data sandwich, is what we call it. On the bottom layer, you start with your satellite imagery from a place, a county, a city, a state. So you, you choose a location of interest, you take an image for that month. Okay, what's your second layer? The second layer um, reflects all the property boundaries within the image that you took. So let's say we selected Howard County for the image. We also have all the property boundaries, shapes of all the properties there that are within that area of interest. That's your second layer. Your third layer are the permit locations. So where are the permits happening 
within the same area of interest. So if you stack all of these together, what you have is uh, a way for the, for the model to crop individual images, as you see on the top of the slide. So, because that's what the actual model is looking at. The model is not looking at the overall county, it's looking at each individual image, each individual property. And it's given the classification that it um, calculated or estimated to be the most likely. So, first month, you can see an example here. You take that location, that image, give it to the model, the model saying it's a start, okay? So you keep doing that every month, month one, month two, month three, similar to the tracking mode as we described before. At some point, that project has to end. So we will see a completion or, you know, if it's a, at some point, if we keep tasking this month by month and it never finishes, then we'll just say it's a uh, unfinished or we'll come up with a different uh, naming for that. But essentially the validation here is you, after the, the model classifies the location, we compare it we ask it, was there a permit on that location? That's the first validation question, right? Because if you have a, a construction happen without a permit, either that place is a non-permit uh, non location or there's something wrong with the actual classification, right? So the first question is, was there a permit for this construction that we're finding? The second question is, what was the progression of classifications from the model for that specific project? Why? Because if when you're classifying these images, there's a certain pattern that it has to, to fold, right? You can't go from here, the project started, and then it finishes like a completion, and then it goes back to a start, and then it goes back to a completion. That would mean the model is classifying it wrong, right? So looking at the actual progression of classifications is another way we do, uh, we use for validating um, the classifications. So, as we were developing the model, we had our IC1 model trained, and we, act, we tested it on different locations. We found out some interesting points. The first one was that um, our classes that we defined on the beginning were a little um, confusing for the model at times between the pre-construction class and the starts class. Why? Well, because in the beginning, when we de defined the classification of a pre-construction, it was meant to be um, a pre-start, I guess. That's, that's the term, it's a pre-start. But the actual starts themselves really look like the clean land. So to summarize, what we had to do was, you know, we started doing the improvements on the category definitions. So we end up with three different categories, which is, first one is ongoing construction activity, and that would show you excavations, foundations, and framing. Then you'd have your class B as your completed structures, so you'd have your residential buildings, commercial buildings, streets, parking lots, any structure that's finished, completed. And then class C, which is very important, that has nothing to do with construction at all. And that might be curious, right? Why, why were you even interested in that? Well, if you want your model to know how to classify something, sometimes you have to, to teach it how to not classify something else, right? So class C for us is, here is our negative class. And this, the reason for, for it is we were finding a lot of false positives. So between the starts, uh, we would find sometimes trees and, and grass and empty lands because the model just didn't know how to classify those. So this way we're doing here made it a lot easier for us to change how, we are, how the model is actually classifying each image separately. So it's either there's some construction activity happening or it's already completed or it has nothing to do with construction. So those are the three main answers that the model gives us for each image um, after improvements. With that, we found a lot of uh, improvements in terms of false positives and false negatives being decreased. And an interesting approach that we took was, let's not just use the validation framework I, we described here, but let's also look into what the model is seeing or where is the model looking at in these images when it classifies it in a certain category? So, for example, if the model classifies an image as a completion or a completed structure, it should be looking at where the building is completed, right? So if you see this image on the slide on the first row, uh, you see there are a lot of things in the image, right? Any property you think about, 
there are many things happening on that property. There might be empty land, some trees, some, uh, some grass, and obviously you would see actual buildings in it, right? So the point is, when the model classifies, is it looking in the place in that image where the humans would look, right? So that's what you see here. It's called activation layers or activation pixels. And interestingly enough, every time the model was classifying it correctly, uh, it was looking at the right place. So you see here in these images are the darker spots, the purple, I guess. You can see it. it's very focused on exactly where the building is, right? And that means the model was looking where it should be looking when it classified it, this image as, as a completion. Same concept can be applied on the right side of the slide side, on, on the slides. You see there, the model classified those three images on the right side, uh, the right half of this image. It classified those as constructions, right, construction activity. And that was correct because you can see uh, foundations or excavations on the three of them. And when you look at the activation layers, you can see it was looking, it was focusing on the actual uh, excavations or foundations. And in this case, it's the opposite. It's the actual highlight colors or bright yellow or bright white colors that he was looking at. So it's interesting that we, we, we learned the model was actually looking at where it was supposed to be looking at. So it was a little, it was a way for us to get into the model's mind. So after we've done that, um, essentially we've learned a lot through how we could make more improvements into the, the model and the CNN. Uh, but at the same time, so you can think of the whole project as, okay, let's keep validating it. At the same time, how do we apply this in a massive scale that census requires, right? There has to be some automation here, some scaling. So what we've done was we created an Alteryx workflow. Alteryx is a data processing platform. And we actually served the classifications via API, essentially to make it possible for us to create almost like an app structure where you select a location, as you see here, and you collect the satellite image for that overall location. Let's suppose this is a county, right? So you start there. Next step is we collect all the property boundaries for that specific area of interest. So that's what you see here. This little, all the little green dots and red areas are the properties, property boundaries for that location. By the way, this is a mo uh, all of these are residential. And the reason why we chose residential first is because if we can do that, we would learn all the lessons we need to expand to commercial or multi-unit buildings. Anyways, so after you have the property boundaries, we are able to crop every single property image. So that's what you see here, some example of these properties or properties images. And each of these images will be given to the model for classification. Here you go. So not only each of them uh, is classified, but we also look at the progression, as I mentioned before. So you see here on the left side of this Alteryx workflow are a uh, month-by-month I guess, comparisons of the classifications the model is giving us. And interestingly enough, you can see there on the first row, the model classified all those four images as completions, and that's correct because that's what it is. There's no construction happening. On the second row or second record, you can see that month by month, it actually shows the progression. On the first image, it was a start, and then I think that that project happened very quickly because it was close to the end, I think, and then you had your completions afterwards, and you see the completions on the images as well. So this is just a way for us to compare the progression of classes as well, not just each individual month. This is good because it gives us a history of the, of the property's uh, construction stages. And then we aggregate, as I mentioned, these classifications and map them back to where they are happening. So you can have your aggregate results for SOC, for example, right? Because if you just have the individual classifications, uh, that, that helps you to validate the model, but for an indicator perspective, you need to aggregate it back. So we're able to do it as well. By the way, this all happens with a, with a click of a run. So of course we broke this down into four slides so you guys can see, but when you run this, you just click that blue button over there and all these steps happen automatically. Here's our start slide. <laughs> uh, that's my favorite slide. Um, 
where we where are we now, right? As as I described this whole project to you guys, we've actually done more improvements to the model in terms of collecting different locations. Right now, we're doing a um, expansion of different locations that we're giving image to the model to find out how well it's performing. However, we already learned some lessons that showed us where to go next. And the next step is an image segmentation model. Everything I talked about here before, I talked about our classification model. And what is the difference between a classification model and a segmentation model, someone might ask, right? I'll tell you. You can see here with the cats and dogs. Classification model, you have one image, one answer, right? Or one input and one output. In this case, an image. So you have one image and one answer. It's a cat. Then you can get fancier, right? You can, you can locate where that cat is. So that's your classification plus localization. And then you can go even fancier, which is can we detect multiple instances or multiple objects in the same image? And that, is, that answer is yes. You can do an object detection. Let's suppose instead of cats and dogs here, what you see are houses, just like our actual problem set. What this gives us is a way to find multiple projects within the same property image, right? Because that happens. Think about a addition or a renovation uh, or demolition. These are, these are use cases where in the same image, you have multiple answers in them, right? And with our current model from a classification standpoint, let's suppose we take an image from a property that has an addition happening. You would see a completed building, and right next to it, you would see some construction happening. However, the classification model has, has to give one answer. So what is it going to say? Is it going to say it's a completion because the building is already done? Or is it going to focus on the uh, start that's happening there because of the addition? That's a, that's a paradox there for a classification model. That means we're switching now to a segmentation model all the way to the right here where you can have multiple instances detected. Not only we can detect multiple instances, so in the addition example, we'll give two answers. We'll say here is the completed building, and right next to it, here is a new start that's happening. Here's a construction activity happening right now. So. That gives us the context. Because we have two of these answers, we can put a business layer and say, okay, this is actually an addition because you have a completed building and you have uh, some construction happening right next to it. So that's what the segmentation is going to give us. Plus, it actually identifies exactly what are the pixels related to that segmentation. So that would help us measure, not only detect multiple instances in the same image, such as a completed building, and the addition happening, but we also would be able to measure exactly how big these are. And that's very important because this way we can tie it back to BPS, we can tie it back to VIP and help put some value in place and other estimators that um, go beyond just saying if it's a start or a completion. And here, um, if you think about the overall project again, right now we're, we have two lanes. The first lane is we're still validating the classification model but we are already starting into the segmentation model at the same time. Uh, the validation is important because we are still to go after different climate zones, so that's exactly what's happening now. We're taking images from different climate zones, humid, dry, hot, cold, and we're seeing how that influences the images, right? Some snow or some of them have more, you know, uh, clean land or arid places. So how does that affect urban and rural places as well? That's an effect because rural places have more sparse, air, uh, sparse constructions and urban, of course, smaller, dense, tight areas. So we're validating the model. And then on, at the same time, we're starting our segmentation model, which is um, going to come out probably in the beginning of 2022. And uh, hopefully we can show you guys some of those results as well. Okay. Thanks, Hector, for, for the overview of the progress on the satellite and machine learning effort. Um, that's one of my favorite uh, parts of the presentation typically, so um, thank you for sharing that. Just before we kind of close up our end of things, you know, I wanted to kind of circle back, um, sort of tie everything together that we've talked about. Um, I, you know, effectively our, this, what we've been talking about today, our ongoing modernization efforts are, you know, leading us 
to the future state of our construction indicators, um, where we hope to replace most conventional data collection with alternative data sources, um, machine learning models that leverage satellite imagery, you know, what Hector just walked us through. Um, and as we combine all of these um, different approaches, we're hoping we can decouple our programs from the limitations associated with traditional survey collection costs and respondent burden. Um, this would allow us for, you know, larger samples, which could reduce our, uh, reduce our statistical error and also allow us to provide that more granular, rich data uh, that our users, you know, continually want more of. Um, that's, that's part of our, our vision here and, and what we're trying to achieve. So there's a lot on our plate. There's a lot we're trying to get done. Um, but we did want to sort of provide this, uh, you know, where we are, what we're thinking, where we're moving forward um, across these various modernization efforts. Um, and with that, I, you know, we have our contact information up here on the, on the screen. You guys can reach out to us, of course, uh, if, if you have any questions after the webinar that you don't, aren't able to get in. Um, feel free to reach out to us, but we definitely uh, thank you guys for joining us. And with that, I'm going to pass it back over to Phil. Wow. Uh, this is a lot of information to take in. But thank you very much, first of all, Aiden and Hector, for the informative presentation on the exciting and innovative changes in the construction indicators programs. And thank you, everyone, for your interest in our data and for t t attending today's webinar. Uh, but before we begin our Q&A, please take note of the contact information that was listed. And uh, uh, if I could, Aiden, if you could, uh, or uh, Hector, if you can put uh, your contact information back up on the screen. As a reminder, we're focusing on today's Q&A on today's topic, and we will be accepting uh, questions related to today's topics only. Uh, if you have questions on other topics, feel free to send an email to us at ask, or excuse me at census.askdata at census.gov. And now, uh, Michelle, uh, we would like to open up the lines for the Q and A portion of this section. So let's check in with Michelle, and uh, can you provide some instructions for listeners to ask questions? Yes, sir. If you'd like to ask a question, please press star 1 on your phone, and you and record your name. Again, that is star 1, and it will take a few moments for questions to come in. Thank you. And uh, Aiden, in the meantime, there were another number of questions in the chat, so if you want to take a look at those and uh, if you want to respond, um, I guess we can take that from there while we're waiting on questions from the uh, operator lines. Sounds great, Phil. I'm going to, uh, hopefully folks have had a chance to see this, uh, the, the last slide here shared, and of course we will provide um, the recording of this at a later point. I'm going to stop sharing this just so I can kind of see the chat and make sure I'm engaged there as well. Um, and maybe yeah, hi, get a couple. and this is Bill Abrides. I'm the Branch Chief of Residential Construction. I've been monitoring the chat, and I can jump in here, too, with a couple, couple of the answers. I've been trying to organize them in some themes. I think there's several questions about what else we plan to do with this data? A lot of questions about expanding into maybe commercial construction or residential improvements um, or things like that. And I think the the long term answer is yes, we would like to do that kind of stuff. I think we're right now kind of in the beginning phase of of trying to get the current uh, data residential construction worked out. But I think that's a possibility down the road. Absolutely, uh, Bill. And, and this is something we've tried to do from the beginning is set up more like a system where we could replicate it to different indicators uh, so or even just different types of construction. So this is definitely something we plan to do. And Hector, this one might be a good one for you. There's a question about is there control for weather interference on the satellite images or will it just be a missing month of data? Yeah, that, that's a great question. And that's what we're studying right now with the climate zones experiment where you know, we're taking images from all over the U.S. and different geographies and climates. So we're going to learn, uh, especially now with seasons changing, winter coming, uh, hopefully we get a lot of snow so we can test the model. Um, but essentially, with the satellite, you you do have a chance. You can go on different uh, dates. So, for example, say we, uh, we try to task a location to collect the image, and that is unavailable for weather or climate reasons. We can go again, you know, next week or the other week, and, and keep trying until we have a hit. 
also um, there are locations where you have constant clouds coverage. So a lot of usually we stay below 15 or 10 percent cloud coverage. If it's any anywhere above it, it's uh, you would have some missing spots. So yes, that's that's a you know sort of a there's no way around it <laughs> other than keep taking the image until you have a clear. Uh, however, this is because we're using satellite imagery mostly. We do, we're watching now actually developments into radar and LiDAR uh, satellites. So that would give us actually uh, vision within the clouds even. So when once we get there, I think we'll be able to get past cloud coverage and even snow. So, you know, there's that difference also between imagery, pure imagery, and also uh, LiDAR and other types of um, sensors. Awesome. I did see uh, one question um, that that uh, was was asking if a start can be identified if if uh, there was no permit data collected, and um, I, the the short answer is you know if we're successful uh, the answer would be yes. Um, and what's interesting about this, what what this made me think of is one of the things that that this approach of using satellite imagery and machine learning helps us with is. Uh, there are areas of the country um, that do not require permits uh, for 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 uh, starting construction, um, and you know our technique currently is we we have to have uh, we have a sample of these land areas that do not require permits, and we have to send um, field representatives out. Uh, they have to drive you know roads, highways, visually looking for evidence of a construction start. Um, you know, as you can imagine, this is uh, a fairly expensive endeavor. Um, so one thing that this, you know, when we were thinking about how to tackle the, the bigger problem, it is also going to help us tackle this, this subset problem, which is, you know, how do you know when something uh, starts in a non-permit area uh, if, you do, if you don't have that permit level data? And again, if, you, if we've developed um, the methodology and, and, and this approach um, sufficiently and successfully, uh, you can, you know, target those locations where you know that permits are not required, and we're going to have a much better uh, chance of identifying these things, um, you know, more quickly, uh, timely, uh, and, and hopefully more accurately. So, uh, you know, I just wanted to speak to that question. I thought it was a great one. That That is a great question, Nate, and uh, you explained it beautifully, actually. <laughs> the reason why we need the permits now, it's more so because we're validating the model, right? Um, as because we need access to each individual uh, property in a way, right? We want to validate the model because we're just developing it now and training and testing. And once we do it, once we know, let's say, you know, this model is X percent accurate for, you know, the different regions of the country, once we know the actual metrics from the model, which we're doing now, then you don't need the permits anymore, just like Aiden said, because we already know, you know, from testing the model over and over again, what are the results. So now we can take it and go and do the same thing on areas we don't even have the permits for. We already validated the model, right? So we don't need to the permits anymore. So that's where it really gets exciting. And in that way, uh, afterwards, we won't need the permits anymore. Yeah. So uh, let me interrupt here just for a second. Uh, Michelle, do we have any uh, one waiting on the, on the line that uh, wants to answer a question? All right, excuse me, I ask a question? Oh, nope, we do not have any questions over the phone at this time. Again, it was okay. star one to ask a question. Okay, thank you. So, Aiden, I'll turn it back over to you on uh, answering additional questions. I see another sure. couple themes in the, in the chat questions that I can help with. So, I think a couple questions have kind of been asking about our, our time series and products and what the changes are. And I think I would say that our Time series length and consistency is really important to us, so we want to try to maintain that. I think some of the the questions are remain to be answered of you know defining a completion, defining a start if we change it. But at this time, I don't think we're ready to say we're you know we're going to break time series or anything. I think that's really important to us, and we just have to make um, some decisions as we come to those. I think the specific question was if a completion has changed to having a roof in, and I'm not sure we're ready to to say that for sure, but it's a good question because we got to think about the consistency of the time series, which is very important to the program. Yeah, I, I, I saw that as well, Bill, and that's I, I, you make a great point. And, and that is an excellent question, this, this idea of 
um, how we define, in particular, the completion um, is, is tricky, and it's something that we are, you know, in the middle of sort of processing the best way to approach this. Um, in our in in the current um, the current way that we produce our estimates, uh, you know, we are um, for for single family, you know, we we define a completion as the uh, presence of a finished floor. Um, obviously, satellite imagery uh, is going to make that a little difficult. We can't see through the roof um, to see if there's a floor in there. Um, but what what I would say is, you know, we're not deterred um, by you know by that that uh, that problem you know to solve. And there are a few things that we can look at. One is, um, again, relying on the wealth of data that we currently have in terms of uh, known completion dates and, uh, um, you know, from the survey, of the current survey of construction, you know, we can look at, um, again, if we, if we have access to the appropriate imagery from the corresponding timeframes, we can hopefully make connections between, you know, how, what's the length of time between the uh, presence of a uh, of a finished roof and the known completion for that, you know, the known finished floors are in place or, or, or what have you. Um, so there's a couple things we can do um, there and, and, again, try to extract and, and, and model for that, that discrepancy if that's a, a, an approach we want to use. Um, there are also other uh, ideas uh, in terms of how to define, a, uh, you know, a, the best way to define a completion. There are some, uh, you know, we've talked about, are there certificates of occupancy that can be leveraged? Again, that's sort of an, another external data source. Um, or, you know, do you use a collection of these points of information and try to bring them together uh, to give you that best, um, most comparable um, value at the end of the day? And, and as Bill said, and I just want to reiterate, uh, you know, for especially for our economic indicators, the, the um, you know the time series is everything, and 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 keeping things on a comparable basis, consistent, um, so that our users have uh, that history um, and that and that uh, comparability is, is extremely important to us. So the, those are the those are the challenges we face, and and of course the problems that we're going to try to solve as we go through this. It's I saw one here as well. Um, it looks like there's a question about uh, you know would the, would this allow us to um, to produce uh, construction put in place um, by state, um, and and again, this is a big driver of, of the overall reengineering effort is is to support that more granular data, and and for the construction estimates in particular, I mean that's that's it's always geography. Uh, you know, our, our users want to be able to perform analysis at the state level, at the county level, you know, at a zip code level, um, you know, whatever we can give them, and and again. By our, our hope here is that if we can decouple our, our current process from uh, or our measurement from some of the um, the limitations that come with collection cost, or traditional collection cost and traditional response burden, which we have to um, which we have to watch out for, um, if we can disconnect ourselves from those mechanisms, we start to be able to do a lot more, um, and and we can expand the scope of our measurement and collection um, in a lot of different ways, which hopefully will support, you know, those more granular products, something like value put in place by state, you know, on a monthly basis. Um, so, yeah, it, it's uh, – I'd, I'd like to say, yes, we will we will definitely do it, but, I, I, you know, of course, we don't know what the future will bring. We're still sort of – you can tell we're right in the middle of a lot of this research and trying to prove in, you know, what is possible. Um, but that is our goal. That's where we're trying to move to. Yeah, but that's that's also something interesting that we're excited to test late in this is, and uh, it's trying to model with different labels, right? Uh, if you think about training, you were always giving it some type of label. So everything we talked about today, the labels were the actual stages, you know, start, completions, for example. Uh, how, if we had another type of label, such as the actual dollar amount that that property has, like VIP, then we could use all those labels and images to train the model to give that kind of classification. So it's something we will um, start exploring soon. There's a couple of questions about where the data is available or when it's going to be available. So I just wanted to point out that the existing data is available on www.census.gov slash starts or census.gov slash permits. You can get to either one of the websites there. And the building permits is already publishing detailed level data down to the local level. And so a lot of what we're talking about here is really improving the methodology for the existing um, data we publish. So 
So I just wanted to make that clear because there were some questions of when this was going to be available. So a lot of this information is available. What we're talking about is improving the collection methods for it. Yeah, great point, Bill. And and yeah, you know, in terms of uh, you know timeline and and when when we can see these things start to be put in place. Um, obviously, you know, the one that's right uh, uh, right on the on the horizon, of course, is this uh, transition for BPS to a cutoff sample. Um, and and right now, we will uh, the plan is to that first release. Um, the first release that, that is based on that new design would be for the January reference period. Um, so that's going to be kind of one of the first things that, that, that you guys can get your hands on. As Bill said, you know, we, we do currently um, provide, you know, um, the, these fairly granular uh, uh, estimates from, from BPS. Um, and what this redesign will do is, is sort of fill in all the missing gaps. Um, for those um, for those places that aren't in that monthly sample, uh, and and you know users could could build up to county aggregates or, um, or or anything below that state level and have something that should be representative of that geography, which would be great. Um, in terms of you know especially with something like the third party um, uh, or the vendor permit data, um, you know that's something that I'm not sure we can put a timeline on yet in terms of the the implementation. Um, one one thing I want to stress is, as we move through these efforts, uh, one thing that we always come back to is we need to move carefully. Uh, we need to make sure that our methodology is sound, transparent, sustainable. Uh, we need to you know we need to check a lot of boxes as we go through this. Um, so you know I, that's that's sort of a, a guiding principle for us <laughs> um, as we do this research. And um, and there's still a lot to do with, um, you know, the evaluation of the, the uh, alternative data sources in particular, um, just to make sure that we are uh, coming out with something that, it, you know, meets the expectations of all, you know, Census Bureau data products uh, being the gold standard for these measures. Um, so I, I don't want to pin us, pin us to a particular timeline for those just yet, um, but, uh, you know, I think our intent is to, uh, as we proceed and make progress uh, in these other uh, in these other efforts um, is to, to continue doing these, these types of outreaches. I um, hope, to, hope to see a lot of you guys back here um, as we can provide updates and, and, and move forward. So, uh, Aiden and uh, Bill and Hector, how much longer uh, are you available? Or if, I guess at some point we do need to let people go and close out because uh, we're running up on 3 o'clock. So. Sure. Sure. Yeah. No. And and I, that, thank you, Phil. And and one thing too for for any of you uh, that have uh, submitted a question, if we weren't able to uh, get to an answer to you today, um, you know, through the webinar itself, uh, we will, you know, have we should have your contact information, and hopefully we can reach back out to you guys and you know pick up any of those questions that we uh, weren't able to address uh, live today. Um, great, really great questions rolling in. Uh, very much appreciated. Um, always good to see the audience engaged. So I think we're about two minutes left, and, and I do want to respect everyone's time as well. So, um, Phil, I don't know for how long it takes to, to, to do our closing statements and, and everything else, but. Okay. Uh, it doesn't take long. Uh, we have the. <laughs> uh, uh, well, uh, uh, if, you, if you're available, uh, we can give a couple more minutes. Uh, I, did we answer everybody's questions, or is there a couple others that I believe, are, you know, revealing through here? I think we got a lot of these, but I'm not sure. We have one question over the phone line. All right, terrific. Dane, your line is open. Um, yes. Um, hello, my name is Dean, um, and. I think this what you guys have done is great. And I'd like to make an observation slash a suggestion is the data you're using with the pictures and the and the um permits, um this sounds like a great data science um challenge uh, onto something like Kaggle where you'd put up the data and say you know who can do better, and to be able to work with the the wisdom of the crowds to do this a little bit better and so my Observation slash suggestion is this is great. Um, perhaps um, opening up the data itself for um, more data scientists to take a challenge. 
Thank you, James. No, I appreciate the the suggestion. And uh, as you said, I mean, definitely our, uh, you know, it's it's best not to work in a vacuum. Um, I, you know, I would say that uh, we've done we, we try to to collaborate with um, a, a number of different organizations where possible in terms of you know sharing our experiences um, with other folks who are tackling geospatial you know um, science uh, applications and, and and problems. Of course, as Hector mentioned, we've also worked. Ex extensively with Statistics Canada, and we've actually learned a lot from them and, 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 and you know, vice versa. Um, but, no, I, I appreciate the suggestion. That is something that I think what, that um, we could consider um, going forward. I would also um, leave it as a, what you've created is a great curated data set, and so for any student and professors to teach and learn how to do this, you've created a great piece of data. Um, sets of data. So even if you don't think you wouldn't learn much, you, you've got a great piece of information that other people could use. All right, I, I definitely appreciate that that sort of uh, that that thought uh, and that angle of uh, or that perspective. That's a, that is a great one. So, thank we'll you. Ask. Thank you. I see. I see one more theme that I wouldn't mind addressing. I think a couple questions reference if we're going to be using this for any type of code enforcement, permit enforcement, or sharing the data. And I can say that once once the data gets to census for this, it's going to be used for statistical purposes. We're not going to be sharing it with any type of enforcement or permits or anything. And the same goes for the current information we collect for the survey of construction. Yes, correct. It's very much a one-way street for those for those reasons. Yeah. Hey, uh, on that note, uh, I think it might be time to uh, end today's, today's webinar. Uh, Thank you very much for everyone for attending today's webinar. This will conclude our presentation. And I believe as Aiden, uh, Aiden and uh, Hector and Bill have mentioned, uh, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to all of them. And I will try, but try to get that, get everyone's contact information in the chat. Or if Aiden, if you could share your screen one more time, you could. All right. Should be, should be shared. So thank you again, everyone. Thank you very much, and I hope you have a pleasant day and then have a wonderful rest of your week. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, guys. That concludes today's call. All participants may disconnect at this time. Thank you for joining.